thank you for listening to a story that comes from rural India. I would just like to know who I'm talking to. How many of you have a working knowledge of rural India? You've spent time in rural India? Is it an entirely urban crowd? Okay, that's good. So you've been outside the big cities. Good, that's good, good. Because um, my story is about rural India and my actual secret motive is to get you to spend more time in rural India. Because I think it's a wonderful place, a multi-wonderful place, and it doesn't get enough attention from us city people. I'm a city person also. So here we go with the story. So this is called Dallas to De Delhi by mistake. <laughs> actually, all of you know Pavitra. I usually don't go around saying I'm from Dallas, actually, because I was only there for a minute. But um, Dallas to Delhi all starts with D, so it sounds good, I suppose. My journey started really more at Stanford University in California, where I met my husband. And that was Stanford in Italy. I met my future husband. We married 50 years ago. Right, and we came eventually to his native place, which was in Dor, Madhya Pradesh. And this was at the time when Mrs. Gandhi had just lapsed the privy purses and all this sort of a thing. What year was that, 72 or something like that, yeah. And um, so we had to move out of the palace and into the first palace that had ever existed in the fort at Maheshwar. So all our bag and baggage moved to a place that was full of bats and cobwebs and a giant gore pad. I've never seen a bigger gore pad in my life. Do you know what a gore pad is? It's like a, what is it, like a baby dinosaur or something like that. They're huge. Anyway, we swept the cobwebs out of that place and we looked around and said, um, let's go and see what's happening here. Because we really didn't know much about handloom weaving other than the fact that the indoor royal family had always been patrons of Maheshwar because Maheshwar was a traditional weaving town. So we were wandering about and a young man came up to us, very nice, very humble young man, and he was holding a sari on his arm. And he said, please, would you help us? Now I'm going to cry, right? He said, please, will you help us? Because we're, we don't have any work anymore. I didn't know anything about handloom. My husband didn't know anything about handloom. But we were at a moment in, in our lives when it sounded like a good idea to help somebody. We were 60s kids, right? So the idea was to help somebody. So this is one of the first people that we got involved with. And she is the mother of a person we were involved with. First, we had to get married. So we did get married. We got married in Indore at the palace. And we got married again in Maheshwar. And I went through something that a lot of people say is not possible. But I went through a Hindu conversion ceremony. And we had a very, very convincing looking uh, Mahatma who was there saying that I was then a Hindu. OK, where Indore is, where Maheshwar is. So I press this thing on the top here. There, there. OK, so Madhya Pradesh is somewhere here. Am I right? Yeah? So and the Narbada flows into, into Surat. So I think. Madhya Pradesh, uh, Maheshwar must be right there. Correct me if I'm wrong, Mother. Yes. Correct? Yeah? So it's kind of in the center of India, kind of. And it's also kind of in the center of Indian handloom, also, because there's lots of handloom in the south, as you know, lots of handloom, Banara side, handloom in Kutch and Gujarat also, right? But we're in the middle, and it's turned out to be a good thing, as you will see as we go along, because Maheshwar weavers were very simple weavers owing to the fact that they had, other way, sorry, yeah. The Maheshwar weaver community, this is the Maheshwar Ghats, looking at, coming down from the Narvada, and up there is where the photographs you're about to see took place. <clears throat> this was a Heliabai's Lingarchan, originally. She used to have a puja done for every single inhabitant of her, of her, Royom, what do you call that, of her kingdom. Huh? She ruled from 1765 to 1795. The facts vary, but approximately that time. So the pundits worked in a series of these, of these buildings here. This is her chatri, which was built after her death. And right in front of these gods is the Narvada here. So what you're about to see took place inside this building, which used to be a Lingarchan. Now, if we're lucky, I can find it. There's the river. And I will refer to the river continuously because it's sort of like our inspiration for 
the flow and the, and the colors and the peace and the serenity of the whole weaving scene in Maheshwar. How many of you have been to Maheshwar? That's good, that's more than I would have thought. Yeah, that's great. So you remember this river then, yeah? Okay, great. So Ahelia by Holkar uh, was not the first Holkar. The, she married the son of the gentleman who kind of broke away from the Peshwa in that period of time, middle 18th century, I think. And they were, as you know, all out foraging and conquering and destroying things and killing people and things like that. She was a child bride. She stayed home and her father-in-law was killed and her husband was killed. So she was left with two children, very young, and the children were young at the same time. And she now is known as Devi Ahelia by Holker, which I think is a title well deserved. And she patronized the weavers of Maheshwar and she's still sort of the patron of the weavers of that whole, of that whole area. Indoor state was quite large at that time. Okay, so just to remind you, those of you who know about saris, this is the traditional Maheshwari sari look. And it is said, you can see that the borders are quite geometric. You'll see some oil. There's supposed to be many more, but they're not there. So most of the borders of Maheshwari saris are geometric. It is said, I don't know, that um, she preferred not to try to replicate anything that God could have created. So there are no flowers and there are no stars and there are no things like that. There are geometric designs which are replicated in the ghats around Maheshwar also. Who, whoever of you have been there have seen that also. They're mostly geometric ones. So there we are 50 years ago, right? <coughs> Relatively newly married and we've just decided to start a weaving foundation. So why did we want to do that? We did it because this young man said, come and help us. But it also seemed the right thing to do, but we also knew nothing about weaving. So we learned from these lovely people who you saw in the beginning, that's her mother. So they were our two teachers and our two instructors at the beginning, along with, okay, wait, along with their son whose photograph you'll see in a moment. Their son's name was Ganesh and he was with us for many, many years. We've just lost him recently in the last two years. But they were the heart and soul of this organization. We needed money. We needed money. We had good intentions. We had no money. So I don't know how many of you would remember Leela Mulgankar. Would you remember Sumit Mulgankar's wife? Yeah. So we knew her through mutual friends. That's Tina Cote on one side and me on the other side there. And so we rang up Leela and said, you're the chairman of Central Social Welfare Board. Central Social Welfare Board, please can you get us some money? So relatively quickly, a grant of 72,000 rupees came to us for which we were supposed to spend one year teaching 12 weavers how to, reteaching 12 weavers how to weave commercially. And we actually made it work, 12, that amount of money in that amount of time. Ganesh, who I mentioned, is the son of the younger woman who we saw in the first two pictures. Ganesh came and he was 22 years old then and he said, well, I'll be manager. What the manager kya karta hai? <laughs> so we said, don't worry. He was just barely literate. He'd read only to the fifth standard. But we said, Ke manager kya karta hai? Hamko bhi nahi malum hai. All right? But we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. So the first thing everybody said you have to do is if you produce products, you have to sell products also, right? So we had this 72,000 rupees and we were creating sardis and they were piling up in the cupboard. So we said, we need to have it. Actually, Martin Singh, do any of you remember Martin Singh, Mapu? Yeah? Very, very uh, influential and wise and benevolent person. He said, you have to have an exhibition. Now, I was relatively new to India at that time and I thought, exhibitionist? I didn't, I mean, you know, I didn't know what an exhibition was at that time. He said, you have to have an exhibition, which is a, a sale come show and all that. In those days, there was Mrs. Pupul Jayakar and and Kamala Devi Chattopadhyaya and Indira Gandhi who were all taking a huge interest in handloom at that time. So we decided exhibition, okay, who do we know? So we knew some people at the Taj and the Taj gave us in what is now some fancy street or the other, we had an exhibition which was uh, attended by lots of people and Ganesh wove and Ganesh was so new to the city from his village 
that when he came to the front door of the Taj, we're talking about the Kolaba Taj here, he carefully took off his shoes outside the hotel and went inside. And the guards were like, oh, come back up, put your shoes on, you know. <laughs> so, and then I'll tell you another story. We, he, he, he wove and he talked to everybody and he was really a good PR person, but at some point in time he had to excuse himself for a moment. So we, he said where to go, so our driver told him, but Nietzsche Jana. He went downstairs and he came back and he read a little bit of English, so he said, Upara men behe or wo men behe? Konsa men So this is only to show you how naive we were at that time, it was beginning. This man ultimately was with us for 16 years, he only retired when his son was old enough to sit at the loom himself and he needed to start his own business. So having read up to the fifth standard and not going to keep your shoes on when you went into the Taj, he led us along a wonderful path of development. So this is Ganesh and our very first clients here. This is Ganesh back in the weaving center, which is inside that building I showed you, right? On the banks of the Narvada. And he's doing what they call journeying, which is, okay, pretend you're looking at a sari. So a sari is long like this, and that is called, the length of the sari is called the warp. And what you see here, sorry, what you see, help, help, here, what you see, these threads, the, these threads are called the warp threads, right? And when you set those warp threads, we'll see more images about that also, you are setting the look and the feel of the sari. What you're doing at this point is critical, which yarns you choose, how, what order you choose to put them in, are they tightly packed together, are they spaced differently, are they different yarns, is there some silk and some wool and some this and some that. But in the classical Maheshwari sari, it's a silk, single silk warp, and what goes across this way is the weft, and I always say weft to right, weft to right, so you can remember, right, all that. So, we needed a market for our goods. We'd had one exhibition, it was successful, then we said, how do we get a market? So that was early days. Fabindi only had one store in GK2, for those of you who remember the first store, right? And we rang John Bissell. We didn't ring him. We didn't have any phones in those days. I think we sent him a telegram or something like that. There were no phones. And we said, John, this is John Bissell, founder of Fabindi, and it's his son, uh, William, who runs Fabindi now. John said, have a little cupboard made carve the name of Rewa Society on the front, make it a glass door. He said, we don't keep saris in Fab India, but we'll keep your saris in Fab India for a minute and see what happens. And that was begin the beginning of a very, very long and profitable relationship with Fab India. We still sell at Fab India, right? So here's a, a sort of an idea of what it looks like inside the inside that court courtyard. This is Granny. Ganesh's grandmother, teaching people how to do all sorts of things. These are the other women learning. This is Tejal Ma, who is still working with us. She can hardly see, but nobody wants to retire because it's boring to sit at home. So they sit at, the, at their station still in the weaving center. So I said, Wave your society buzzed with activity, bobbin winding and all that. Bobbin winding, you may not know what it is, but to make, to fill the bobbins, the bobbins are thrown back and forth, back and forth across this warp that you saw Ganesh tying. So that's what creates the cloth. So here we were, we didn't quite know what we were doing. The women definitely knew that they needed work because they had, and I'm sorry, this is not an anti-man discussion at all, but unfortunately in that area, there were many of the weavers who I think because they had very little work, they sort of took to alcoholism or just lying about, not doing much or anything. So it kind of became up to the women to earn the money to feed the kids, right? So it was, Maheshwar has always fortunately, people say because of Ahelia Bai, it's been a very non-sectarian sort of place. Hindu Muslims, no problem whatsoever, touch wood, till today. So like we've got this lady and this lady and I've known them all my life and there's never been any disharmony. They go to each other's pujas, they attend each other's functions, marriages and all sorts of things. This is just to show you what kind of a group we were and then to the group, my husband and I added some kids eventually, right? 
which somewhat changed our perspective on how much time we could spend there because eventually they had to go to school, right? But this little guy, my son Yeshwan, who's just had his first child recently, right? He's 35 now, and Sabrina, they grew up weaving. He used to sit at the loom all the time, and he now runs Rewa Society, right? Rewa Society is still making Maheshwari saris, that's the cotton and silk ones, and we started another. So these, this is just to give you a quick, how many of you recognize these Maheshwari saris sort of things? Are they familiar? Yeah, yeah. So this is just to give you an idea of the colorways. These are the more traditional ones. Remember this one and compare it to the colors you saw in the sunset picture on the Nirvana, right? So they take a lot of inspiration from what they see carved in the ghats and what they see in the river itself. Okay, this is called Jordani, which is what you saw Ganesh doing when he was first uh, photographed there. And you can see how he set the patterns now for different, for different uh, weaves that are going to be done. Everything depends on whether you put this many pink threads here and this many purple threads there and all that. I'm sure each of you has a check sari or a striped sari or something like that. That's where the decisions are made. The hands you see here are hands of students from 10 different weaving areas of India who participate in our newest project, which is called the Handloom School. We, our attempt is to give a helping hand to young weavers who feel that there's no future in weaving anymore and to explain to them how to cut out the middleman and deal directly with the market. The middleman usually gives them the minimum possible wages for what they're doing, and the bulk of the profit goes to the middleman always. It doesn't mean they're bad guys, but it means that it's an unsustainable system today. Weavers are now on WhatsApp, they now have phones, they have everything. They're very well aware of what's going on in this world, so they need to earn more. To earn more, you have to have fewer people between yourself and the sale. So these boys, you will see them, they are learning how, not how to weave, they all know how to weave. They're learning how to weave in a profitable and sustainable way and to satisfy also the traditional markets but also the contemporary markets, right? This is what, these are, these are shuttles. Inside you see the bobbins which were wound by the ladies, right? And this is what dictates how the cloth is going to look. So this is just give you an example. Here you can see, you can see the, whoops, no, I'll see again, sorry. You can see the threads going vertically, or the weft threads. Depending on how you throw the weft yarn in and how you treadle the lifting and dropping of the weft, the warp threads, that, that affects both the color and the pattern in the in the whatever cloth you're weaving so our our Hanlum school students Hanlum school is our most recent project actually and we're very very happy with it we have good funding from tata trust and from mrs anita lal of good earth very very generous funding so we're able to train only 32 students per year mostly males but some females also those 32 students, when they graduate from six months with us, they know every single aspect of a weaving business. How to cost and price your product, how to make a profit, how to present your product, how to use WhatsApp as a tool for selling. All these things they know. Now, do they get a chance to use it right away? No. So we try to keep them in touch with the market by their continuous weaving after they leave us. We have. 73 graduates in the field now in 10 different areas of India and they all need work in case anybody wants a sari woven or something like that I'm telling you they're really wonderful and they know how to deal with you on whatsapp or they can deal with you through us also here they are preparing one chap is from Kutch, one chap is from Himachal right now after you prepare it and weave it then you have to quality control it. So this is happening with one of our supervisors here and one of our students. They go through every single centimeter of the cloth and see that there are no, maybe all of you have bought saris which have some flaws in them. It's a bad experience which happens when there isn't good quality control. We try to avoid that. Here, <laughs> these guys are looking at the, the weavers from Kutch and Barmer and some from Rajasthan are fantastic at booties. 
They're excellent at bootis. The other guys don't all know how to do bootis. So they're studying how this was done. And this particular piece of cloth comes with a little story because it was woven by a really nice but very shy young man who had always ever woven in his hometown only dupatas, 2.2, 2.5 meters. And I saw him weaving and we all knew that we were going to a very prestigious exhibition at a friend's home in Delhi. So I said, my young, just keep weaving. Don't stop at 2.25 meters, make a sari. And he was frozen as though you were telling him to climb a mountain or something like that. Like, but I've never done that before, you know? I only weave scarves, I just said, keep going, keep weaving. 2.2, 2.5, three meters, right up to 5.5 meters, which we needed. We quickly cut it from the, from the loom, packed it and took it to Delhi, set up our show in this lovely drawing room of a friend of ours, and guess what happened? The prettiest girl who came to the show said, I want that one. And he was grinning from ear to ear. He, she bought that sari, and it was the first thing that sold in the whole exhibition. He's never looked back after that. I don't think he's making saris all the time now. So, why do we choose women? I've already said a little bit about this. Uh, the name of our organization is Women Weave, and we deal mostly with women. Not all of them are women. Not all of them are abandoned wives. But a, a sadly large percentage of them are either abandoned or otherwise in distress. What happens is that they become the shadow weavers. The husband will still, after the sari has been woven by her, he will take it to the master weaver to get the money, right? So to break that unhealthy syndrome, they come to our center, they weave in our center now. Their husbands cannot get them. Some husbands used to, drunken husbands used to come into our center and slap their wives around a little bit, sadly. So they're safe here. The money comes into their hands, and the children after school, we have a school for all the children of Rewa and all of the children of women we've also. The children come after school and sit with mom for a while, which means that by definition, they're going to learn a little bit about weaving right from the beginning, and they all do know a fair amount. Sometimes people even come to sleep, <laughs> you know? This is, this is the way it is. You, Children in my sort of brought up to the sounds of the loom, which is sort of a clickety clack, clickety clack sound, and that's just part of the scene. This is this woman is a bobbin winder. I was explaining to you. All those are the threads which will eventually end up on the bobbin, which will eventually go across the warp as as weft to make the sari. So these are just some shots of different different. See, this is a Maheshwari pattern. You can see on the on the borders, they're very very simple things. In in Rewa, they still weave mostly saris. In women weave, most of our product is khadi because the name of our women weave organization is Gudimudi. Gudimudi in the local language means scrunched. The local language is Nimauri. So khadi, when you weave it, has a very high twist. And when you weave a high twist against another high twist, it scrunches up, right? So Gudimudi means scrunched. And what she's weaving right now is khadi. And our khadi, mostly yardage, not saris, and yardage and scarves, goes to 22 different countries in the world right now. We're very proud to say. And we have a good website, and we have very loyal clients. Amongst them, Anoki, for example, Good Earth, definitely, for example. Other big companies in Vancouver, Canada, Maiwa, and then smaller clients also who come. So children are always present in the in the center. Children are, have finger skills and thread skills from a very early age. And they also, by definition, are getting color skills just by working with color like this all the time. These are the children in the Rewa Society School. When they first started, some of you may know Ferozan Meta. Does anyone know Ferozan? She set our curriculum for us in the very early days. In the very early days, they had no such handsome outfits and shoes and things like that. They came rather rather bedraggled and barefooted and things like that in our very, very early school. Now we have a big school with over 200 students and they do all sorts of things. And these are the teachers who've been there for a long time. There's Ferozan, you can see. And I'm, there's the students. I'm mentioning Ferozan when I should be mentioning dozens and dozens of other people who have also been such a big part of helping this <clears throat> project get off the ground and stay off the ground. 
but here they are. And I want to say to you that a lot of these kids, it may not sound like to you like the best thing that could happen to them, but a lot of these kids will become weavers because it actually is one of their best alternatives. Unless you want to leave Maheshwa, unless you want to leave your home, your parents, and all your friends, and go somewhere else, your best alternative, if you know how to weave, is to weave, right? What does best alternative mean for those of you who are familiar with wages and things like that? A good weaver can weave anything between 5,000 and 15,000 rupees a month. Formerly they were earning 1,500 rupees or 1,200 rupees a month, right? But that was many years ago. So it's not a lot of money, but by comparison to what their expenses are living at home in their village, it's enough. And then they pool it because there may be four or five weavers in, uh, in us. We've had many, many, many mentors. This is just one of them. Her name is Dosi Lewis. She comes from Connecticut. She goes all over the world, training people in things like braiding and wh what would you call Pavitra, other ad added value things that you do with a fabric. Borders and braiding, it's finger skills which are not related to the loom, but which can be added to the loom. So Dosi is teaching her how to braid and you can actually braid that braid into the cloth to make it part of the garment at that time. So like Dosi, we've had so, so many people come to work with us and we, we also go out. We have three, three areas in Madhya Pradesh where we work with outstation places. I don't know how many of you know Madhya Pradesh, but we work in a place called Dindori. I know Paul knows Madhya Pradesh. In Dindori, it's very much a tribal story. This is Dindori. Dindori is about four hours from Jabalpur, if that helps anybody, right? And these are Adivasi weavers. They have been no electricity, and they're very, very, very primitive looms. So what we did was get them money from the government, actually, to these, get these cycles, which actually you pedal them, and it charges a battery, which you can use in your cell phone. It charges your cell phone battery, so that they could then interact with the world a little bit, talk to us at least, where we were. Uh, now, since, since this shot was taken about a year ago, they got electricity in their places. But that's another good reason why handloom is still a valid income earning activity. Lots of people still don't have electricity, right? So it's something you can do without electricity. That's just to show you an example of their motifs and their look, which is a very tribal look, which is super popular in Los Angeles and Stockholm and Japan and things like that. Okay, these are our goodie body products. Again, just to give you an idea, <coughs> we, <coughs> we have new patterns all the time. We had recently some Swedish interns who came and they were absolutely delightful. And Swedish interns don't talk very much, but they work very hard all the time. So they made us lots of swatches and lots of samples and some of those we used in some of these patterns to make the weaves. So here's the guy who you saw when he was very little standing at the base of the ladder, right? He's now taken over Reva Society. We celebrate a joint Holi every year and Holi is rather raucous. Lots of color and some other things come into this Holi celebration also. So there's Yeshwant leader of Rewa Society, and there's his mother, <laughs> covered in color. And we are celebrating with the weavers. That's one of the biggest holidays in our part of the world. Now, I would love to answer any questions that you may have about what we're doing or how you could be a part of it. Pavitra, set, set, the, set the pace here. Ask a question. Yeah. Thank you, Sally. I think it's more of a comment uh, than a question, but I think that one of the uh, things that Reva really did was set the, it was a trailblazer for many of us who wanted to create branded uh, products out of handloom and out of craft. And I think that the partnership between Fab India and Reva, and maybe you can talk a little bit more about that, and sort of this idea of what it means to be patrons of craft uh, in the context of the 21st century. That's a very good thing to talk about. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it was very different when Fab India first started with us. They were only one store. It was actually a risk to invest in us. Um, people now don't view purchase or, of handloom as as big a risk as they used to. We work with a lot of fashion designers. We make a lot of cloth for 
really top fashion designers in India and outside of India. And the beauty of working with the designers directly is that once they start to understand about the flexibility and the potential of weaving, you can actually do what we call placement weaving, which means that if we're going to weave this scarf, for example, but we know we're going to make it into dress material, so we will weave it in such a way that this part comes down here, right? And then there can be other little gold lines up here or booties or whatever, whatever. So you're actually getting a very bespoke product because it's specifically designed for the garment that is going to be cut from it. So it's, it's in that way that we work with a lot of the designers, not only for women's garments, but also for men's garments, particularly in the, in the Kadi. Rewa doesn't weave so much for garments because the Rewa cloth is quite sheer and doesn't take stitching so well. But this Kadi is quite robust and it, um, once you've washed it, it, it likes being worked with. So um, that was a good question, Pavitra, and I hope I've answered it properly. Yes, please. Yeah. Um, where does the yarn come from? Because that's what you start right. with. That's a, also a very good question. Rewa Society, for some reason, had always ordered its silk yarn, which is the warp, the length of the fabric, from Coimbatore. Right? No, so, sorry, sorry, from China. Yeah? From China. It's called China Silk, actually. And the weft, which was a mill-spun cotton, came from Coimbatore, right? Which meant that there was absolutely nothing local about the product, because the, also the, the zari that we use came from Banaras also. So this is one thing that we wanted to address when we started Women Weave. Maheshwar is actually located on the banks of the Narvada. As all of you know, cotton requires a lot of water. So there is a lot of cotton grown. There is black cotton soil on the banks of the Narvada. So it's a cotton growing area. For really fine cotton, you need have long staple cotton, right, Bhagwa? Yeah, okay. But what's grown in the Maheshwar area is short staple cotton, which gives you a thicker. You can't, you can't spin it and weave it very fine. It'll break, right? So Goody Moody, the name given by Ganesh, who I told you was our very first director. Goody Moody means scrunched because the very first thing we started making was khadi spun from the locally grown cotton, which gave it a high twist, which made us a thicker cotton. And the demand for that was more than we would have ever thought because it stitches well. So we sell, particularly in the Scandinavian countries, in Japan, all over India, designers like to work with this khadi because it doesn't need any lining. It takes a seam well enough. It's not too transparent. And you can do all sorts of things with it. It takes the dyeing really well also. So um, I forget what the question was, but I hope I've answered it. Yeah? <laughs> yeah, OK. So you seem to have introduced some technology in the process, but more on the sales side, WhatsApp, etc. Uh, Are you looking at introducing some technology even in the production side or on the skill side, which might help the handloom uh, weavers even more? So that's an interesting question, and I guess I have many reactions to that. We are most effective in the, in the most marginalized areas of India. The ones which are close to urban areas have inputs from Varanasi or, or um, Ahmedabad or whatever. You know, there's lots of NGOs working in Hanlum and they have, it's okay then. For example, a lot of you probably know Judy Freighter who's done color Aksha and things like that. They do embroidery. To go back to your question, if we work with the most marginalized groups of weavers who are the ones who need us the most maybe, we have to stick to something which is fairly simple, right? And which is not subject to a lot of change in trends and fashions and things like that. So we're sticking with this basic cloth right now. We, almost everybody has electricity now, which is good news. That's different from when we started. That's different. So they don't need electricity anymore. They do need cell phones. And cell phones are very useful to them. So we focus a lot on cell phones because that's their, that's their access to the outside world. Apart from that, they, yes, they need knowledge about effective dyeing. Probably all of you have bought some handloom in your lives which you wore it the first time you washed it and then it was all over, you know. So dyeing is a big area where we try to give inputs 
we bring them to us to teach them dying. Just now we're teaching natural dying also because there's a big trend for natural dying, as well there should be. But natural dying is much more expensive than ordinary dying. So dying would be one thing. Um, connectivity on WhatsApp would be another thing that we bring to them. Apart from that, I don't know, what could you think of that we could, could, we could help them with? I don't know enough about the industry, so I can't no, really comment to say on we, that. But, we link uh, them with clients you know, directly. Anything which enhances the productivity of the people uh, and improves the cost efficiency would obviously help in That's you know, the total true. cost. But so. if that anything is something which is quite expensive, then you have to look at uh, how, how that's going to affect their business because their business, businesses are very fragile. They spend some money to buy raw materials, they weave those raw materials, they have to sell them, get next money back and buy some more. They don't have a lot of working capital, right? If, hmm? I think one of the struggles uh, that the handloom industry in India faces is that when you mechanize a loom, you take away the sort of indigenous skill of a particular region of weavers. So the fact is today Maheshwari saris, Chanderi saris are not woven only in Maheshwar or in Chanderi. You might have a highly successful unit in Trichy, you know, or in Karur that is weaving these saris. So when you invest in the hand skill, what you actually do is preserve the, the local culture and the local skill local butas, local techniques, and because we are an oral culture, because these things are passed father to son, mother to daughter, what, keeping that process free of mechanizing, mechanization is actually a way to preserve its unique local identity. Uh, it's really good you brought that up and, and that you brought that up also. Particularly concerning the fabric that's created in the Hanlum School by these kids from 10 different states and more soon, I hope. We're targeting the fashion world. Why? Because the fashion world can pay more per meter than the average client would be willing to pay because they convert it into a garment which then is very highly marked up. So I go around all the time, especially whenever I'm in Delhi, but also in Bombay sometimes, talking to very well-known fashion designers. Now here's what I've learned. I thought that a power loom, do all of you kind of know what a power loom is? And it cranks things out, it's not very charming, it's very loud, right? I thought that a power loom had a certain minimum quantity that it needed to weave, but I was told by one of India's top fashion designers, whose fashions I really love, he said, Sally, one hour from me, he's in Delhi, one hour from me, there's a guy who will weave me three meters of anything I want anything I want, including the booties and the whole thing and the whole thing. So then, if all of it shifts over to power loom, you can crank it out fast, what are you doing? You're actually devaluing it, in a way. And it's, it's a race which is going to continue forever, and it will only continue. The fashion designers who I have met and talked with in Delhi have said to me very clearly, we could tomorrow shift all of our production into power loom fabric. And our average customer wouldn't even know that it's power loom. We choose to support handloom because we believe in handloom. And you have to applaud those guys. I'm not going to name them because I can't name all of them, but they're some of India's top ones. They also do power loom, but they also conscientiously do handloom also. You look like you want to say something else also. Do you have a thought? No, no. I also wanted to ask you as to what is your vision 10, 20, 30 years down the road for your uh, initiative? Is it going to so, sustain, uh, you know, do you have a vision beyond yourself or does it need you to sustain the movement? I think that we will become more and more and more rural, even Maheshwar, population very low, will become more like a metro area and I don't know what will happen in those areas. The place where we're still valid, what we do is deep interior India where there is no other employment. I can't tell you how many, uh, one of my missions here I forgot was to get you to visit rural India, please. Please come and visit rural India. It's a very interesting place. And one thing you will understand is that there's very little source of employment in rural India. So you asked about the vision for 10 years from now even. <clears throat> I think that we'll probably be working further and deeper in rural India and linking them more and more with clients like Pavitra and those who believe in this worldwide, who will buy it because it is handwoven, right? 
and people will weave it because they have no other alternatives. Either they have no power or little power or things like that, but it does have its own, particularly like, like the Japanese and the Swedish, and who else, Pavita, really values this? Good Earth values it. Yeah, yeah, this whole sustainability thing is gaining traction. Of course, we know that fashions come and go. Tell me. Yes, uh, to continue the earlier question, uh, so therefore, you would be able to produce even uh, one piece for a fashion person abroad. Absolutely. Because I do have a friend in Italy who produces Link us to for her. all the top designers. Right. So, so that's my dream. I can see, I can see um, uh, Chanel dialoguing with uh, Bhagwat Saab Weaver over there on WhatsApp. Now, now you put this stripe here and put this booty here and all that. Yeah. It'll happen. Yes. It can happen. Because yes. she's in touch with all the top ones. She's in yeah. fact flying in at this very moment. Please put us in touch. You know, I just had this flash that maybe Please I Please put should... us in touch. Anybody, yeah. put us in touch because you're right. Pavitra's right. There will always be a trend for the speciality and the handwoven and things like that. Right. The yeah. other thing is because of the glamour of handwoven stuff, yeah. you know, they do tend to definitely veer towards that yeah. um, in the West because they see the value of it which has gone from their lives. You know, yeah. you know, uh, it's much like spirituality which has evaporated yeah. abroad. So they're coming back to it. Yes. You know, because it's the organic way to grow yourself. Really. Mm. So I feel that there is a future. Mm. It's just a matter of nurturing it. Uh, yeah. It's just a matter of nurturing it and creating it the sort of love and awareness amongst yeah. all of us. Which but you, you have, have to. Done, you have to create it on both sides. Which you have done. Which you have. You done. have to create it on the side of the person who's buying it. Yeah. But the side of the Ganesh who you saw. He said to me once, hum log kue mein kabutar hai. <laughs> right? We have no idea what's going on in the outside world. Yeah. We have no idea. You're calling us wonderful weavers. We think we're gari bicharas here. Right? So you have to change the weaver's vision of himself or herself also. Then they will want to continue also. Yeah. Right? A certain innocence is good though, I feel. A certain yeah, innocence. No, no, believe me, they're pretty innocent. In, but innocence... Hungry innocence is, is still hungry innocence, right? One yeah. last question. Mm -hmm. As an ignorant person, I'm saying, um, so therefore no two pieces can be the same. From the way oh, the warp yes. and the, yes, the yes. warp and the weft warp. No, no, many pieces can be. You can make miles and miles of the same thing. Similar. It's, it's according to how you throw that shuttle. You know, you saw the shuttles bobbin with all the bobbins around them. If you throw them tightly together, yellow, red, yellow, red, yellow, red, mm -hmm. you have a fine stripe. Okay. If you do two inches of yellow and four picks okay, of so red. Okay, so can be precise. In, in 100 meters, you can do 100 different stories. Okay. That's so wonderful. But you can't do that cost effectively with a, co with a power loom. No, right? no. Right? So sure. that's, that, that, that you pointed out exactly. It has to eventually become bespoke. And always. one more question, because I'm going to talk to my friend, is are these, uh, these colors, therefore, reliable, you know, in, in terms of... Are graduates? Piece? No, no, the color, the coloring. The colors. Is, no, that depends on what you want to pay for. If you do it with the dyes that we use, that's mm. more expensive, but that's reliable. Okay. If you do it with natural dyes, it's always a risk, and we will tell you. I mean, Pavitra knows this also. Indigo is a very tricky color. It's a very popular color. It's a very tricky color also. So we often tell people that they should um, dry clean their naturally dyed things, but they want it. Natural dyed products are like 20 to 40 percent more expensive. Right? But, but people, it's the thing. Everybody wants natural dye now. There was someone here who wanted a bagger. Yeah. Sir? I want to ask you about what, what you're doing about putting zari into your weaving. Okay, zari is very interesting. I just always never thought about zari before. Zari is actually what? It's a bunch of nylon, <laughs> right? Which has been passed through a bath. What do you call it? Electrically, you, what do you call it? Electroplated. Most of this happens in Surat. The, what they call Asli Zari comes from Varanasi mostly. You have to know the guy who knows the guy who knows the guy. And those are woven in the most expensive wedding saris. And what happens is that is Asli Zari, right? And it's built up on a silk thread, not on the nylon. You must have noticed when you when you go home and see your saris again, the, 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 the Nakli Zari ones don't feel nice, really. But the Asli Zari ones are much more expensive, right? Yeah, Sally, uh, you know, I come from Guwahati, which is an Assam. Ah, I've and been I'm to Guwahati. Very, 
very, very close to the Hualkusi weavers community. Your women are fantastic weavers. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, the challenge that I see in the weavers there is the next generation do not want to continue this art. But that's you know, because everywhere. Yeah, so yeah. how do you motivate or how do you motivate your weavers so that they can continue this tradition, you know, for years to come? We on make it so that they earn more money. There is no other motivation that's going to work long term. And just so you know, there's a group from Guwahati coming to our organization yes. soon. And Tata's is putting a lot of money into handling in, in uh, your area of the world. So. They won't all stay, but some people can stay and it has to be seen. You learn by watching somebody else weaving and earning more money. Then you're going to, you're mostly backstrap weavers, right? Yeah. No, the main problem is because it's just one side, you know, at one side or one corner of the country. Yeah. They all want to come out and do something different. Yeah. You know, so uh, it's very difficult to keep them motivated that, okay, you know, do for I know, and your women are not submissive and quiet like the no. women in my yeah, no. <laughs> right? They're definitely not. Outspoken, very literate, and quite dynamic. Yeah. I think the only thing you convince, can convince them are these massive interventions, which Tata's is just about, is just That's launching right. into. Right. They will not convince the women who, who are able to do something else and earn more. They will convince the women for whom this is the best alternative. Right? And there are, a lot of, there are a lot of people who come in from some other sector and start weaving. You don't have to be a traditional weaver to be a weaver right. and to earn well. Yeah. There was another question over here somewhere? Yes. Tell us a bit more about the inspiration for the designs in the weaving. You know, I wish that I had um, close-up pictures of, well, inspiration. Okay, here's our last. We take inspiration from all sorts of things right now. This was a... These are leaves from our badam trees in our school, right? So this was one of our teachers who came from the uh, Royal College of Arts. She did a whole teaching session on using these leaves. They created designs. They recreated these designs with the colorways and everything. Ilana Dixon, she teaches at the Royal College of Arts. We created these designs in weaves. All right, so there's two aspects to design. One is reviving and sustaining the old, and another is adapting and introducing something new. You have to be very careful with both, right? Both can be mishandled and misused. But we're constantly, constantly doing this. Oh, very much. To revive and preserve and No, no, nobody's restricting anything to anywhere anymore, I don't think. Rewa society weaves traditional Maheshwari saris because that's what they weave. So it would look odd to have a Bengali border on that. In the Hanum school and in Goody Moody, we are not restricted by anything traditional particularly. Other weavers who come to us from the Hanum, for the Hanum school from these 10 different areas, there are, you'll be interested to know that there are lots of weavers who come from areas which are not necessarily very traditional in any way. It's just been a form of, like Moshidabad, which is outside of Banaras. They're sort of, they are just nothing but grinding weavers for the master weavers of Banaras, right? The, the, the weavers who live in Baranasi, they've grown up in that culture. The ones who are in Moshidabad and other outlying areas, they're just weaving to eat and live, right? So I don't feel bad introducing other designs into there, if that helps them to earn something. The really traditional design period, you can tell me better than I would know. You know, Kutch, Rajasthan, where else? Maheshwar, I suppose. Bengal has its its traditional designs. Where else? Varanasi, of course, where? Orissa for sure. Orissa for sure. Yeah, West Bengal. So there are, and one would not really tamper with those, I don't think. You could perhaps t play with dimensions. Huh? I'll do, do things that I've always been sorry that can be turned into yardage sometimes. Th there you have to see what the market wants really. And I know that they're, they're traditional and they're sacred in some way also. So one, those weavers in any case, they earn well. Those really good weavers from Varanasi and West Bengal and things like that. They're not leaving. They're going to continue because they have a very good market. The, the wedding sari market. I saw another hand up. Yes. I just want to know where traditionally where the silks come from. In, in Maheshwari, you, you mentioned China, yeah. But the, the silk that we use well, in the Maheshwari, sorry, that's called China silk. 
the other I'm say as in historically. Yeah, from around, uh, from around um, uh, Bangalore and places like that, am I right? The it silk never, comes from South there India. There was no local silk. In our area, no. In our area, no. Tassar, that area, nothing. Tassar silk, yes. Tassar silk was not traditionally woven in the Maheshwari saris because it's crunchy and scratchy and things like that. Um, Tassar silk we now incorporate in certain things. But correct me if I'm wrong, t most of the silk in India is, is reeled in South India, no? In and also in Assam. And, and also your beautiful, your beautiful Muga silk. Your beautiful Muga silk, yeah, yeah. So I don't think all that will die if all of us pay attention and conscientiously buy hand-woven cloth. But push your vendors to get you new stuff if you want new stuff also. Right? I, did I already tell you this story? I don't know. One of the biggest chains, I'm, then I'm finished, okay? One of the biggest sari chains in India, I won't name it because uh, the owner, one of the owners is a friend of mine. And he's been a big patron of the Hendam School also. And he says, actually, the whole sari market in India is run by about 16 to 20 of us who run the market, right? And he said this to me two years ago when I first interviewed him three years ago. I went to his store and we'd had a long talk, at the end of which he said, well, I know you Americans, you'll always talk and then I'll never hear from you again. So I said, we'll see about that. And I've been in touch with him a lot after that. But he said, concerning these weavers and the, and the middlemen, 15, 16 middlemen who run this business in India, he said, for the first time ever, there are fewer weavers and we have to be nice to them now, right? So I'll end on that note. <laughs>